Welcome, everybody. We're delighted today to have Alec Frazier, uh, virtually, of course, um, but a shorter plane trip, I suppose. For those of you who don't know him, Alec is a lecturer at King's College London, where he also received his doctorate, uh, and he's now there in their schools of business and government. Uh, Alec is interested, in, his research areas are in innovative finance and evidence-based public policy, which converge delightfully in the study of social innovation bonds uh, or pay for success contracts, which will be the subject of his talk today. So Alec, we're delighted to have you, uh, you know, through, in this uh, brave online world. Please, the floor is yours. First of all, just to say um, thank you ever so much to, um, to, to, to Nick and, and to, to Gary. Um, for, for, for the invite, it's it's really nice to get this opportunity um, to to talk to to you all. Um, and I was going to try and talk for about forty minutes, um, and then uh, leave some time for for questions um, at the end. Um, I, I hope that's okay. If there's anything which is really unclear, then then do shout and, and stop me, um, and I'll um, I can take questions as I go. Uh, but I was I was planning on on, on mostly talking um, for yeah forty to forty five minutes. And what I wanted to talk about today is um, about the. The, the, the topic of social impact bonds, as we call them in the UK, um, often called pay for success um, uh, approaches in, in the US. And I'm going to talk about um, experience from the UK and also other European countries. Um, so um, let me move on. Um, OK, so I'm going to split the talk up into three parts today. Um, the first part, I'm going to give you a bit of a, a kind of English or, or a UK perspective on social impact bonds. And I think that's quite useful because social impact bonds are uh, an English or a, a London phenomenon. Um, this is where this is where they began. Um, so I can give you a bit of a, a kind of talk around how and why they developed here um, and exactly what we see them as from a from a UK perspective, because I know that um, uh, many of you, you, the students amongst you, have done some studying of, of social impact bonds or, or, or pay for success approaches. So I can give you a bit of a kind of background of where the idea came from in the UK. So I was going to spend the first 15 or, or 20 minutes just giving you some background. And then I wanted to talk about um, my particular um, interest in, in social impact bonds. Uh, which really comes from a, a long-standing interest I have in uh, evidence-based policy, evidence-informed policy and practice. Um, and I want to talk about a paper we, we wrote and a broader um, study which I was involved in, which looked at the, the first social impact bonds which were developed in the UK um, in health and social care. So I was going to spend the second part of the, the talk going through um, some, some findings from that evaluation we did and talk about the, the, the promise and, and the reality, really, when it comes to social impact bonds helping us uh, achieve policy and practice, which is better informed by evidence. Then in the third part of the talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about some more recent research I've done, which we're just finishing up, actually, uh, which we've been doing for the last two or three years, where we have looked at social impact bonds and how they've been applied in non-UK European settings. Um, and in this case, we're looking at social impact bonds designed to help um, people either get into education or get into employment, particularly uh, young people. And we're looking at some projects in, there's one in the UK, a couple in the Netherlands, one in Germany and one in Switzerland. And I think this is quite a nice case because it, it highlights some of the, the barriers perhaps and some of the resistance to um, these innovative ways of thinking about solving uh, social problems in other uh, kind of non-Anglo-Saxon um, UK or US contexts. Um, so hopefully that will be of, of interest. So before kind of getting into the, the, the main part of the talk, I thought it might be helpful to just spend a couple of minutes um, just talking about my background and, and how I ended up in this space. 
Um, so so I, I, after my first degree, I um, spent my, my, my 20s, really, I spent a decade working in, in public sector management in the UK, in the, in the health service. So I was a manager in, uh, in, in hospitals. Um, so my background is, is public management. Um, but over time, I kind of got more interested in, in the theory um, and, and research around public management than actually being a public manager. Um, and so I went on to do uh, a, a PhD when I was about 30 here at King's. And I was very interested in this, this question about how we use evidence, either um, as managers um, or in, in a political uh, sense to, to justify public policy decisions. Um, and after I finished my PhD, um, I was kind of looking for, for something um, else to do. And I, I got a, a different job in a different college in London um, where we were doing research directly for, uh, for the government in the UK. Um, and I was uh, asked to work on a project uh, evaluating social impact bonds in health and social care. And I knew, um, I knew very little about them uh, before kind of falling into this research. Um, but they've been, they've been fascinating things to look at. Um, because I think they offer a really interesting angle into some really crucial public management questions about how we reform um, public services to make them uh, more, more effective. Um, and also, I keep coming back to the, these questions about evidence use and how we can harness evidence uh, to, to improve services. So I've kind of jumped fully into the world of social impact bonds. Um, and, and I'm involved in a conference we run every year. And if any, any students are interested in um, maybe submitting any, any papers, there's a, there's a, there's a link there. Uh, we run this every year. So it's, a, it's quite an interesting research area as well, more broadly with, with a number of um, researchers kind of really um, doing a lot of work in this area. So that's uh, a bit about me and my background and kind of where, where I'm coming from. Um, so what I wanted to do in, in the first part of the talk um, is, is really kind of give you a sense of, um, yeah, how, how I think about social impact bonds. Um, and this talk I've kind of adapted from uh, uh, a lecture I give to my uh, third year undergraduate students where we look at, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about wicked, wicked problems, kind of drawing on you know, classic Rittle and, and, and Weber ideas from uh, the, the early 1970s. Um, and so I, I find wicked problems you know, immensely um, compelling. Um, and I think this is quite a useful framework for, for thinking about um, why and, and how it is that these innovative approaches to, to solving public policy problems, such as social impact bonds and pay for success, um, why, why they may have been developed and, and, and how they can help us. So when we think about wicked problems, there's a number of different wicked problems that, that we could talk about. One, um, which I think is really salient here in terms of social impact bonds, is this issue of recidivism um, or, or reoffending. You know, when people go to jail for, for a small period of time when they come out, um, very often they end up um, committing further crimes and going back to, to, to prison. So, you know, that's, that's a, a wicked issue, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about in the, in the following slide. Another wicked problem is uh, something we term in, in the UK, at least, uh, we call it a neat problem. So this is young people who are not in education, employment um, or training. Um, and these young people, um, you know, in the UK, we have school, um, mandatory school until about 15, 16, and most kids will kind of go on to, to further study or to uh, training programs. But we have a, 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 a real kind of stubborn problem where, you know, some people will get disillusioned with education, they'll kind of drop out, not find a, a training program. And we know that the outcomes for these young people um, are, are very poor if they don't get into education, employment or, or training at that kind of point when they, they leave the education system. Um, so this is, you know, this is a wicked problem that we've been dealing with for, for a number of years. Um, 
And also, yeah, employment services for other marginalized groups uh, like, like refugees, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in the third part of the talk. Um, issues around youth offending, family breakdown, you know, often these, these problems are, um, as, as Rittle and Weber kind of talk about, you know, problems become symptoms of another problem. Um, and so it becomes really quite difficult to, to, to solve these problems. Um, we also have done work looking not just at kind of younger people, but also older people. So we've, we've done an evaluation of a, of a project which is trying to use social impact bonds to reduce loneliness and social isolation. You know, even pre-COVID, this has been a, a big issue in uh, certainly in the UK, especially with, with, with older people. Um, you know, how do you solve a problem like, like loneliness and, you know, people living quite isolated lives? Um, another big problem which social impact bonds have tried to tackle, uh, particularly in the UK, is around rough sleeping and homelessness, which I, I know is a problem you also share uh, across in the States. Um, from a health perspective, uh, there's lots of long term health conditions, you know, will cause further um, social deterioration and further problems for, for, for people. And so, again, these are the kind of things we, we might try and tackle with social impact bonds. And then away from kind of high income settings like the UK or the US, um, there's lots of wicked problems in um, low income countries and social impact bonds or development impact bonds have been developed to try and solve some of those issues. So these are some of the wicked problems that, that we've been looking at um, and trying to see if social impact bonds can be part of the, the solution to these problems. So. A big issue, um, and the first two social impact bonds really uh, in the UK and the US were focused on recidivism. Um, so we've known that you know reoffending rates have remained really high in the UK for, for, for decades. Uh, there's a link there to, to all kinds of data on this from, from the UK government. Um, and you know, we, we've struggled to, to help people stay on the straight and narrow once they come out of prison um, in this country. And I think this is a nice example of a wicked problem because it, it's so complex. It cuts across you know, what the public sector can do, what the private sector can do, what charities and philanthropies are, are, are able to, to contribute. Um, and when we think about these problems, they go really deep, you know, links to, to family life, to early years and development, the kind of education experience that, that people get, the opportunities for employment before committing a crime or after committing a crime. You know, these are, these are quite complex things. And then beyond that, you know, these problems are linked to how we, how we fund prisons. So we, we know certainly in this, this country, that I'm gonna talk about over the last 10 years, we've, we've really cut a lot of funding to um, our social services. And so how, how do we fund prisons? Uh, what are the cultures like inside prisons? Are they primarily about rehabilitation or, or, or more punitive ideas? How do we support people when they come out of prison? And then even deeper, which kind of gets to the, the, the subjective nature of these problems, which I think Rissell and, and Weber bring out nicely in, in, in their wicked framing ideas, is that these are moral subjective issues. You know, um, what is prison really for? For some people, it's about punishing people who've you know, done um, abhorrent things. For others, it's about trying to rehabilitate and, and help people to, to improve their lives. So a real kind of complexity around these issues. And, and I'm sure none of this is, is new to you. But I think where the social impact bond comes in is, is a kind of new way of trying to tackle these problems, which previously we, we've, we've, we've struggled to do. So I'm going to take you on to the next slide. Um, this is David Cameron. He was the, the Prime Minister of the UK from 2010 to about 2016. He then went away and we didn't hear anything about him. He's currently embroiled in a, in a huge scandal over here. <laughs> so he's kind of, he's back, he's, he's back on uh, everyone's um, kind of everyone's aware of him again now. I was going to, to jump onto this link of, of David Cameron launching um, the, 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 the big society, but I'm not going to, because I think that will, um, that will take up a bit of time, which we're probably a bit behind. But uh, essentially, David Cameron was, was very interested in this idea. I mean, the original idea uh, came from his predecessor, uh, Gordon Brown, 
uh, who was very interested in kind of bringing the best of the public, the private and the philanthropic sectors to, together. What we saw in the UK from 2010 um, was um, government austerity, where following the banking crash of 2008, um, there was a, a real retrenchment in terms of how much um, the, the government was spending on public services. Uh, so Cameron called this a, a kind of new uh, a post-bureaucratic age, and he wanted a smaller state to open up opportunities for uh, socially minded private investment, philanthropies, and uh, to draw more voluntary labor to help solve some of these social problems. This slide really just takes us through what, what social impact bonds are. Um, for, for those who, who haven't um, come across them before, really they're a kind of development in um, paper for pay for performance programs. Uh, so we've used them a lot in the UK, particularly in, in health services, as a way to try and incentivize improvements in, in performance. Um, but what's, what's novel about the social impact bond um, are that we're getting private investors involved. Um, and if a program is deemed to be successful, then a private investor can make a return on their investment. If a program is not seen to be um, successful, then the, the risk of, of program failure shifts from the, the state to the, the private investor. So they're seen as a kind of win-win-win opportunity. So if they work well, you get better outcomes for service users, um, we get a return for investors, um, and we should get cash savings as well for the government. So yeah, so we, we have social impact bonds really in an attempt to um, tackle some of these, these wicked issues um, and yeah, solve some of these social problems. Um, they're interesting in, in, in many ways. Um, and I think I've been through most of, most of the reasons, this kind of idea of kind of shifting transfer from the public sector to, to the private sector. Very much in the early days in the UK, this little graphic on the bottom right-hand side from social finance is really quite interesting. There was a real rationale that social impact bonds would deliver cost savings um, to government. Um, I think now if we look at you know, 10 years experience of social impact bonds, um, I think there is a, um, an acceptance that it, social impact bonds are unlikely to deliver uh, substantial cost savings to government. And if they do, they're likely to be hypothetical rather than real cost savings. Um, a second thing is this early focus on uh, rigorous evaluation and the importance of, of attribution also seems to have slid away slightly in the UK. I, I don't think it's the same in the US where I think you, you still have more of a commitment to, to rigorous evaluation, uh, but that is, that is one of the things we, we've seen over here. Um, and the, the pie chart there just shows you um, the different areas uh, where social impact bonds are, um, are progressing in the UK. What do we know about social impact bonds? So when we started looking at them, we were one of one of the first research teams really to get into this area. So we we did a very kind of systematic review of the literature. This is back in kind of 2015, 2016, to try and understand what was what was going on to really frame our research. Um, and what we found was there was very little empirical evidence about the effectiveness of social impact bonds at that time. Um, there is more empirical evidence now, but there is still big, uh, big gaps in our knowledge around um, effectiveness in terms of um, user outcomes and, and particularly in terms of costs uh, around social impact bonds. So we found that the literature really was a, 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 a selection of, of kind of narratives about what social impact bonds might become. At the heart of it, we found what we call a public sector narrative, a public sector reform narrative, which talked about how, as I've kind of articulated already, how social impact bonds might bring different, set, you know, the best of the public sector, best of the private sector, the philanthropic center, sector, bring them together to try and deliver better, more effective services. There was also a financial sector reform narrative which kind of built out of a, loss, a kind of loss of faith in, in, in finance, certainly in this country, following the banking crisis. And social impact bonds were seen as a way to rehabilitate um, the financial sector and, and show a more human side. Um, but thirdly, we identified a very strong cautionary narrative 
um, from most academics who who looked at this idea uh, were, were were really pretty skeptical um, and and pretty cautionary about the the dangers that there might be with social impact bonds. In theoretical terms, um, one of the ways I like to teach this with, with my students is to to think about the the implications in terms of of management reform. Um, so. Mildred Warner, who's written a lot about uh, SIBs from, from a, a US perspective, she suggests that they might be seen as a kind of a, a, an extension of the new public management. So, you know, more measurement, more, more managers, more management and, and more marketization. Um, and she says that because we've got private investors involved in social impact bonds, this is kind of new public management on steroids in a way. Um, and she identifies some, some, some problematic elements with with that, with that idea. Um, on the other hand, other researchers have, have suggested that actually social impact bonds have the, have the, have the potential to, to lessen some of those harsher elements of new public management and bring us towards something closer to Osborne's work around kind of new public um, network governance. So, you know, this, this focus on, on collaboration uh, the importance of relationships uh, amongst the different parties and a more neo-corporatist approach to uh, delivering public services, uh, which is seen in, in more positive terms. So there's a theoretical kind of argument going on as, as to what SIBs really are. Are they taking us further down a new public management route or do they represent a kind of softening of some of those elements? And a lot of our work has tried to explore some of these, these theoretical questions. Okay, so that was part one. In part two, I want to um, talk about uh, some, some case studies which we've, we've worked on. So first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, work we did in the UK. So this is uh, work which, which was commissioned by the UK government um, to really explore the idea of social impact bonds in health and social care. And I'm going to talk about work from, from the main study, the main report we produced, and also I'm going to talk about a, a paper which we wrote really looking at how evidence can be, um, how evidence use can be promoted or not through social impact bonds. So just to take you through the methods we used on this, um, this study, uh, we did just under 200 interviews with uh, various participants from the different uh, parties, whether that was providers, uh, local government, uh, investors. Uh, we did a lot of uh, documentary and, and contract uh, analyses to really understand legally what was going on here. We also did some comparator research uh, where we looked at similar or the same provider delivering a similar or the same intervention, uh, but financed more conventionally to see what difference the, the SIB was actually making. We also wanted to do uh, quantitative analysis to look at the, the effectiveness of these um, programs, but it was very difficult to get the data to do so. So we, we couldn't do that part of the work. And I think that is a theme we, we've seen in, in other evaluations. It's very difficult to get firm quantitative data about the effectiveness of social impact bonds. This is a very busy slide, so, so apologies, but this gives you a sense of some of the projects we were looking at in this evaluation. We originally had nine projects to look at. Uh, the four at the bottom were never, uh, never came to anything. So again, we have quite a, a, a high failure rate for social impact bonds. They're very complicated, very difficult to get off the ground. The five at the top are all programs which went ahead. Um, one of them, the top one there in Manchester Foster Care, this was taking a kind of off the shelf um, treatment, uh, a, a US program called Multidimensional Treatment Foster Care Oregon, uh, which was trying to help young people who were kind of on the borderline of um, delinquency. Um, we also had a, one in London, which was looking at homelessness. We had a program in, in Newcastle in the north of England, which was looking at uh, people with long term health conditions. And the, the Worcester one there was looking at loneliness. This is one I mentioned earlier. So very diverse uh, programs. OK, so the literature suggested three ways in which social impact bonds could promote better use of evidence in, in public policy. So the first idea was that social impact bonds 
could promote specific interventions for which a positive evidence base already exists. So my example of um, the, the, the foster care intervention, um, you know, lots of evidence in the US that this thing works. Could we take it to the UK, try and implement it um, and, and see good outcomes? So that's one way social impact bonds could promote, um, could promote better evidence use. Secondly, because social impact bonds are so focused on, um, on, on data in a kind of day-to-day -day, um, sense, um, there was an idea that social impact bonds could lead to um, better day-to-day -day use of evidence in these kind of local settings. So could we see that? Could we see that uh, people were using evidence more, more effectively on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis? And then thirdly, uh, there's an argument that because social impact bonds often involve independent evaluation, they may promote you know, greater um, links between the research community um, and uh, practitioners. So those are our three uh, potential ways in which social impact bonds could promote evidence use. And if we go on to the next slide, um, I can talk through what we, what we found. So in terms of that first promise then, um, that you know, we'd have more evidence-based programs, um, we found it was a mixed picture. So uh, we did see that the proposed um, interventions with the greatest evidence, you know, basically the better evidence there was for a program, the more likely it was to get um, implemented. However, we saw that social impact bonds could be used for completely untried novel projects where people are willing to take a risk, like the uh, loneliness example. In terms of the second promise about you know, getting, especially third sector organizations to perhaps use data in a more uh, effective way. Um, again, our findings were, were, were equivocal. We certainly saw much more data collection and that data was being used more, but there was a problem in that a lot of the data became monetized. So they became linked to outcome payments or uh, process payments. Um, and then that caused contestation really between different parties. So we, we saw lots of disputes around data. And then finally, this idea about SIBs leading to better um, dialogue between researchers and practitioners. Um, we didn't really find this. Um, we found that there were very few um, really rigorous evaluations um, and at least in the UK, there was a step back from, from this focus on, on attribution, which had been a, a key part of the early um, work on social impact bonds. I wanted to say something about the promising overall findings um, in, related, in, in relation to social impact bonds from this evaluation. So we concluded that SIBs in the UK in health and social care certainly do have the potential to be a useful tool to, to get uh, better evidenced uh, programs and also to, to test new things out. Um, and we kind of felt that if you have a problem where you have identifiable, easily identifiable, um, attributable outcomes, and realizable cost savings, they have some real potential. So for example, the, the foster care intervention in Manchester could really save money. Um, we also found that social impact bonds really do encourage collaborative working um, amongst people who would never normally work together. You know, in the UK, certainly uh, in the public sector, we, we tend to not be that good at working outside with, with the private sector or, or, or charities. Social impact bonds really encouraged, it really encouraged people to, to work in novel um, and exciting ways. Um, and the, the social impact bonds that we looked at um, really showed you know, greater managerial attention and, and, and flexibility uh, and a real focus on service delivery, um, which was a, a real improvement compared to um, the, the, the non-SIB uh, services we, we compared the SIB ones to. So those are the promising findings. If we go on to the next slide, I wanted to highlight some of the more um, kind of cautionary uh, elements really. And the first one is linked to this point I've, I've already talked about, about this, this monetization of process targets led to some real organizational friction uh, amongst the different um, parties. 
Uh, we saw lots of examples of gaming, um, which um, probably isn't a huge surprise. Um, we also saw that there was a real absence of, of outcome data and cost data, which make it really hard for us to um, talk about the, you know, to, to give a real answer to government about whether this is something to kind of go ahead with or, or, or not. Um, and as I say, we saw over the time we looked at these early UK social impact bonds, this initial commitment to uh, really rigorous evaluation, attribution, kind of slipped down the agenda. And also the early talk about cost savings also was became less important. Um, so I think these are really things we, we need to think about because um, it, it could well be that you know, social impact bonds are a much more expensive way uh, of delivering uh, interventions. This takes us into the, the final part and hopefully I'm, I'm doing okay time-wise. Um, then the final part, I just want to take you through this more recent research I've been doing with uh, a good colleague of mine called Deborah Heavenstone, who's based in, in Bern uh, University now. Um, so Deborah and I wanted to try and understand more about how SIBs can be transported to other contexts away from the UK. Um, as I've said before, the idea really emerged in London and the UK. And as you can see from this graphic in the top right, um, we still have many more social impact bond programs here in the UK than elsewhere in the world. So as you probably know, the USA is kind of the, the, the next country along. But most European countries have been quite unenthusiastic when it comes to social impact bonds. Um, there's another area around development impact bonds, which I'm not going to talk about, but you know, those have been developed in, in low and, and middle income countries. Um, and we've seen that the most popular uh, type of uh, sector for developing SIBs internationally is around employment and training services. So this led us to, um, to design our, our research. If we go on to the next slide, please. Um, this is the this is the study which which Deborah and I have been working on, um, and we really wanted to test out the, the the effectiveness of social impact bonds in in social services in different countries. This is work which was funded by the the Swiss Network for International Studies. And if we go to the next slide, I'll give you a bit more detail on on what we were looking at and where. So we looked at five different social impact bond finance programs, uh, which were all helping to get um, mostly young people, but not always, um, getting people who are kind of out of work or out of education back into the workforce or back into education. So we had a program in Sheffield in, in the UK. We had two in the Netherlands, one in, in, in Rotterdam and one in Enschede. Uh, we had one in Bern in Switzerland, which was looking at helping um, refugees to get into uh, paid employment. So mostly people from, um, from Afghanistan uh, and, and Syria who, who'd come across to Switzerland. Um, and then we finally had a, a small program in Augsburg, which is near Munich in the south of Germany, which again was looking at helping you know, young people. Um, who are not in education, employment, or training to, to, to get back into get back into it. So if we move to the next slide, I can talk about what we actually found. So um, as ever, it was very difficult to collect all the quantitative data we, we wanted. Um, and we couldn't collect quant data from all the sites, but we, we're very happy that we, we did manage to get good quant data from uh, one of the Dutch sites and the Swiss site. Um, and we found a, a positive SIB effect um, in the sites. Um, so this is quite interesting because it's very difficult to, to try and prove the effectiveness of social impact bonds. Um, but we, we, we think we have. I've not done the quant analysis. That's my colleague, Deborah. So, um, so if you have complicated questions about the quant analysis, I'll have to defer to her. But when we're trying to explain these findings, we're not convinced that it's actually the SIB which has made these, these differences. Because in Switzerland, um, we found that the SIB finance service was much better funded than the conventional service we were comparing it to. And in the Dutch case, we found that the SIB mechanism actually encouraged the provider to um, reevaluate the kind of services it was offering and, and to kind of offer a much more effective program. 
And we found also that in both of those cases, the SIB finance cohorts um, probably were starting from a higher level in terms of employability than the non-SIB cohorts. And this leads into the, the qualitative findings on the next slide, please. What we found overall was that the principal aim of these, these interventions across these different European settings wasn't cost savings for the government. Rather, the programmes were going ahead because they were seen as mechanisms to kind of drive these public sector reform issues. So to change the mentalities, the ways of thinking of local government officials and, and providers. They were also intent on kind of establishing and furthering the, the SIB concept itself and accessing new sources of finance. Uh, the programmes were framed as experiments or pilots. So when we kind of found issues that were, were perhaps problematic about them, uh, people said, well, it was OK, we're just we're, we're experimenting, we're trying something new. So that kind of burden of proof, I think, was a bit lower in these programmes than, than we might expect in, in, in normal um, non-experimental uh, or, or non-pilot studies. Um, and again, as we found in the UK, uh, the contracts enabled kind of gaming, um, and they prioritised in investor uh, outcomes over government savings. So again, you know, we, we have question marks about the overall um, effectiveness and the overall cost effectiveness of these programmes, uh, which, which we might want to come back to in, in the conversation uh, when I finish shortly. One of the things we're working on, we're working on a paper where we're trying to account for these international differences and, and think about what it means more broadly. Um, and what we found is in the UK, there's a lot of support for, for the idea from, from central government who give, you know, um, quite a lot of subsidies to really get the thing going in, in, in the UK. Um, good rates, you know, high rates of uh, return for investors um, and a kind of lack of accountability or transparency around where this money is coming from, and where it's going from, going to, sorry. So I, I think we can see that the SIB is quite well developed in the UK with similarities in the Netherlands, actually, quite quite similar in, in economic outlook, if you like, to, to the UK. In contrast, we find in Germany and Switzerland, there's real resistance to the social impact bond idea um, where government, both central and, and local government, is, is really quite suspicious of what they see as quite an Anglo-Saxon kind of financialized uh, way of um, mediating um, in, in public services. So we don't think there's much of a, a market really for an extension of social impact bonds in, in Germany and Switzerland. Um, if we just um, maybe skip over the next slide, Gary, because I'm conscious of time, I'm just going to the summary. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is how I'd, how I'd summarise the, the, the talk today and, and really kind of six or seven years, you know, thinking about the, these, these things, these social impact bonds. So I think they're a really interesting public management, public policy um, development. Um, I think they do encourage policymakers to think about these wicked public policy problems in a new way. Um, I think they, they encourage collaboration, they encourage innovation. Um, when we look at them in comparative international terms, um, I think we can learn quite a bit about different countries, different um, infrastructures, different ideologies. Uh, when we look at way, why they might spread in certain countries and, and, and not others. Um, and, and ultimately, I think, you know, SIBs have got real strengths. I think we've we found that empirically, but they do have weaknesses as well. And, and, and there's a lot of unknowns still in terms of, in terms of costs, in terms of effectiveness. Um, and just to finish, really, I, I, for me, I feel that the jury's out on their future. Um, I don't know if we'll be talking about things called SIBs in, in five or 10 years. We, we may be, we, we, we may not. Um, so I think that's a question I'd kind of quite like to, to put to your students, actually. Um, you know, what, what do you think the, the future is for, for, for these kind of ways of, of, of solving uh, public policy problems? And, and how, might you, how might you think about modifying them? So one thing that struck me looking at your cross-country survey is that uh, here in the US, at least, the discourse around SIBs 
it hasn't really about, been about cost saving so much as uh, waste prevention. So that uh, there's real hesitance, partly political, I think partly just cultural around spending money on these types of problems and uh, risk aversion that we might have nothing to show for it. And then you'll be an elected official and you spent all of this money on an anti-recidivism program and there will still be crime. There won't be the evidence base that we like to think a said would generate and your opponent will run against you saying that you spend money on criminals. Uh, and that so that the, the SIB mechanism may not be cheaper, especially ex post, but that it will either generate some kind of quantitative evidence base that you could point to to rebut those accusations or um, uh, or if it's a failure, then the investors are the ones who lose out and not the public fisc. So when you when you see these international differences in these attitudes, is this just reflecting uh, a difference in the politics of spending on things like recidivism or, or on loneliness or these other types of um, areas where maybe the Anglophone countries don't spend enough money? Or is it something deeper about the, the structure of risk and public management that ties into other dimensions of spending on stuff? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I think at one level, it is about cultural views about what the role of the state is. Um, so I think um, I think on, on the one hand, um, I think the UK is kind of a bridge between the US and, and maybe um, you know, countries like France and Germany or Scandinavian countries. I think um, there's, there's a sense, certainly when we, did our, when we did our research in Germany, that you know, these are things that the state is providing um, or the state has always provided uh, you know, in collaboration with uh, some of the large charities over there. But there's a sense that you know, a much more interventionist state, um, these are things which, which should be provided through taxation. Um, and there's a real suspicion uh, when it comes to uh, the idea that, that someone might make a profit as an investor out of um, a social problem. Um, so there's, you know, there's a big kind of critical literature uh, which, which looked at the um, homelessness social impact bond in the UK and kind of came at it from an ideological or, or a moral position saying it's, it's you know, morally abhorrent that people could make profit through um, the fact that people um, you know, are, are living miserably um, in, 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 in very difficult conditions. So I think there's, there's an ideological element, there's, there's a cultural element, there's a kind of existing understanding that certain services would be provided by the state. And I, and I think it, 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 it's different in the US where I think, you know, you, you don't have that same wraparound um, welfare state as, as most European countries will have. Um, again, in, in Germany, when we were interviewing uh, investors, they were, they were really quite... Um, they were frustrated that they couldn't get this idea off the ground. And they said, well, a big, a big problem here is that we, we just don't have the, 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 the money problems, which you have, you know, there's, there's enough money to, to fund these things. And I think it's not a, a coincidence that in the UK, it was during this decade of austerity when we were cutting back from um, traditional funding for public services, that social impact bonds kind of had this opportunity to kind of step in. Um, I think there's also a really interesting point about evidence use and the difference between the US um, and, and certainly the UK and other European countries. I think policymaking um, in the US tends to be guided more by um, positivist um, assumptions, quantitative data it is, it is used more. Um, I think we're, we're really quite poor at drawing on um, quantitative data, um, experiments, um, RCTs in, in social policy in, in this country, um, which um, in, in comparison to, to the state. So again, there's this kind of epistemological element as well in terms of, you know, what is valid data um, and, and how can we use it? And then I think that combines in with this broader kind of moral understanding of, of what the state is for. You, you anticipated my follow-up question actually, which was 
going to be about the hypothetical situation where, okay, you're Germany and you believe it's your, your job to spend on these things, but then why not do something sib-like with an RCT where you, you try a, you know, there's the traditional way of solving this pro addressing this problem, and then there's a, a new way that might be better. And then that can be the benchmark against the measure as opposed to, I guess, the US system where we just continue not to serve the control group and, and let them, uh, you know, leave them to their fate. And, and then that's our comparison. But you, you could imagine the same methodology just with a different reference point. But apparently there's not much uptake for that type of approach. Either. No, not really. I mean, that's, that's a really good point because we, we often kind of, we spent a lot of time talking to people in this space um, about, you know, if you're going to reward investors, you know, you, you really have to be clear that, you know, we can attribute these, these differences to the intervention. Um, but then you get into the questions about what are you comparing it against? You know, nothing um, or the existing services. But then when you go to a country like Switzerland or, or, or Germany, um, and you interview the local government people, they have um, existing interests in the status quo. Mm. Um, so they're resistant to new ways of experimenting because um, they're quite happy with how things have gone before and they can see it as a, as a bit of a threat. So they're quite happy to look at some of these ideas as kind of neoliberal, Anglo-Saxon, financialization because it, it serves their own purpose to, to protect what they already have. So I think, um, yeah, you kind of get into these issues of, of who's protecting territories um, and, and what it is that, you know, they, that they really want to see. I, I don't want to jump in on some student questions because certainly I, I, I could spend a couple hours with you, Alec, just chatting about what you've learned, but well, let me just say something and then you can react to it. And if other students have put your hands up, please, and I'll, I'll stop. So I kind of I, I kind of summarize both Nick's question and, and your answer, Alec, and thinking about this broader question, well, why would we want social impact bonds to fit into um, one of three things? The first would be, you know, there's some sort of political constraint that means that we have to go outside of the current system and processes. And Nick you know, gave a compelling reason why in the U.S. this might work. Um, there could be a budget constraint. And as, as we both know, well, you know, that was the actual first impetus for doing the SIB in the first place was to delay payment on services. We didn't have enough money to do it. Both of those are fine reasons, but I can't imagine that SIBs would be sustained long term if all it is is like a, a way to alleviate a political or a budget constraint. There's probably much better and effective ways to do that. The third way to me is the SIBs actually provide an, an opportunity for innovation, for social innovation. And, and there, I think we have to assess one of three things. One is, do we get new novel creative approaches to problem solving? Um, secondly, do we actually um, accelerate the speed of social innovation? Um, so that you can move from piloting or, or evidence-based programs in one place and then diffuse them into a new place, in part because of the level of collaboration that, you know, that you, you noted. Mm -hmm. And then the third to me is, is it a way, like we never had a way for private investors to participate in social good production before. Is it an innovation in that it just provides that path? And, and that path is important enough that we ought to create something, you know, like a SIB so that social investors could invest in, in that way. And so that's where my thinking has been kind of the, I'd love to hear your comments maybe on the third set, not on the innovation piece, not so much on budget and political, but, but I think those are important questions for us to answer collectively as a field. And each country is going to be, you know, kind of in a different space as it relates to certainly the first two, but, you know, again, in my view, unless we, actually can produce evidence of innovation on one of those three other areas that I don't think they have a long, his, uh, long future. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a really good reading of it and I, I would absolutely agree. And yeah, so moving to your, your third element then, this, this opportunity for social innovation. Um, I think, you know, in terms of your first point, you know, new creative approaches to solving solutions, I think we certainly see that. And I think, you know, that is my... Um, I think that's the thing I've been most impressed about um, in terms of what um, social impact bonds 
potentially um, can do. Um, I worry about your, your second point. So this um, way of accelerating uh, the speed of social innovation. Um, I'm not sure if we've empirically seen that um, yet. I think one of the problems with SIBs is they're incredibly complicated, expensive, um, difficult to set up. Um, they can become quite contested. Also, you know, again, why I think they they can lead to creative approaches is they've got long timelines. Um, so instead of you know having a year on year uh, contract, um, you can have the one we looked at Newcastle had seven years. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to then use that to accelerate things. I mean, it depends on the you know the, the kind of time scale we're thinking of. But I think that is is a, is, is slightly weaker certainly in the UK. Um, and then this issue about private investors uh, being involved in doing social good. Um, I think there's there's elements of that. I would I would say in the UK the experience has been much more that these are these are mostly philanthropies who are putting the money up, who would have done this anyway. Um, so they they would have just given a grant, whereas now perhaps they can recycle their, their money. In the UK, we have uh, really subsidised these things through uh, government funding. I think that kind of investment side is, is a kind of perhaps less borne out in the UK. And the final thing I'd say is I think what may really limit the, the, the future of SIBs in the UK is that the, the Treasury, you know, the, the government, central government, I, I think they've looked at these things and, and I think they think they are very expensive, very complicated. Um, and I think that the jury is very much out from a, um, from a financial and economic point of view as to whether these things um, will, will make sense. So I think it kind of comes back to the politics and, 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 the, and the economics, uh, which you didn't want me to look at, but I, I, think it, that, I think there's no getting away from that really. But I, I agree your, your, your points are, uh, a, a really excellent ones to look at. Talia, uh, you have a question for our speaker? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm sorry to do this literally at 11. Um, but speaking of, you know, your response to that last question, just sort of like new and creative ways to approach these old issues and um, things like that. I was wondering how much of the battle of, you know, getting funding and getting public support with, especially issues like, you know, like you were saying, like homelessness, as well as um, like loneliness too, that's not uh, necessarily a um, fully, the majority of the public is not supporting of these issues necessarily, at least to throw money at and support. So my question was kind of how much of the battle is around the framing and the naming of the issues that they're aiming to address. Um, it sort of comes from something that just happened in my hometown, but they have the city has just bought a property that's going to be sort of a resource hub. And they've been very specific about the way that they are naming it. They don't want to call it a um, homeless shelter. They don't want to call it anything like that. They're just saying it is going to be, you know, a place that has 25 rooms for individuals that are experiencing homelessness where they want to, you know, throw, um, they said, smother them in resources mm -hmm. to help them to get back on their feet. Um, so they were very specific about the way that they framed it. And I think it's because of the, you know, not in my neighborhood sort of, and all of that, they want to make sure that they are um, framing it in a way that they can get public support, um, which I think, I mean, is going to be a good, th what they're doing is good. So I think it's just sort of to, you know, reduce the, the backlash. Um, but just from your experience, like how much of that is um, important? Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question. Um, and I think in the UK, the, the, the kind of the public relations side of this for individual programs is really strong. And again, this kind of collaboration of people coming together, showing different ways of looking at a problem, I think really works. So the London Homelessness Project has had fantastic publicity. Um, it's, it's gone really well. But the one which springs to mind, which was different, was the one in Switzerland, where it was this program to help um, refugees get jobs. Um, 
that was highly political. Um, and what we saw there was we also got um, the original politician who championed this then uh, lost office halfway through. Another politician came in from the right who didn't want anything to do with helping homeless people, uh, helping refugees. So it, you can get into all these kind of complex battles. And then with the, with the one in Switzerland, as I said, the, the overall findings were, were really quite positive, but the politician didn't want to champion those because they went against the, the broader anti-refugee rhetoric, which was there. So yeah, these things are incredibly politicized. Um, and, and so, yeah, no, I think you've, you, you've really identified an important element there. That totally makes sense, because now I'm thinking about at least, um, you know, in Denmark, they have extremely aggressive immigration issues. So it, de it definitely depends on the issue and also the place like that's um, it's going to be really contingent on those two things. So, yeah, Absolutely. thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, because interestingly, the, the original politician was attacked. He was from the left. He was attacked for financialization and then the right wing. So it's just, it's so political. Um, but that's what makes it fascinating to look at as well. It also speaks to your uh, observation earlier that it's a very positive, positivist way of thinking about social policy when the, the post-positivist critique would be, well, who's doing the measuring and why are they yeah. looking at it? And uh, I, sometimes that gets overplayed, but certainly in the example that Talia is giving, that's exactly... Part of the situation that's feeding into this possibly. Fantastic. Um, we are a little over time. Obviously, we had some technical difficulties. Do anybody have any last questions on the tips of their tongue? They're just Hillary. Okay. I think that, that is, we'll close it with you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you. This has been super interesting. Um, and I'm doing research in social impact bonds um, with Gary as well. So definitely a, a topic I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, one thing that I'm really curious about is sort of how social impact bonds are leaving sort of lasting changes, if any, after the ends of the contracts and what sort of processes or, or structures they're putting in place for that. Um, and I think one area um, that offers a lot of potential is in performance management and some of those systems you were talking about of, you know, the local data collection with the service providers. Um, and so I was kind of curious, you said that you saw that it's mostly been used for just for tracking the, the monetized outcomes. Um, but I'm curious if you think that those are systems, are there any indications that those systems might be used in, you know, after the contracts ends, if maybe there's a way to improve those so that it's more useful to service providers in the long run when they're not just tracking outcomes for for these contracts that need to be monetized, but sort of what's the potential for that? And are there any ways even within the industry that are there sort of common um, data collection systems that are being used, you know? And so just yeah. if you could speak to some of those sorts of issues. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a brilliant question. And, and there is exam, there are examples, sorry, um, of that. Um, one of the, one, when these things work really well, they incentivize the third sector, the, the, the charity organizations, they help them improve their kind of in-house work around data collection. And, and we've certainly seen a couple of good examples of that. Uh, when they work kind of less well is when a lot of consultants are brought in to kind of do that work quickly. And then that knowledge, that organizational learning is lost. Um, Interestingly, we're just starting a new project this year. There's a, there's a social impact bond in London, which is coming to an end um, at the end of this calendar year. Um, and the research we want to do is to explore exactly this issue. What happens after the SIB funding goes? So we're going, it's a, it's a healthcare one. It's a, um, a HIV reduction program, which has been really effective in South London. And we want to follow it for two or three years after to see, well, these collaborations, this extra money, this excitement, which gets things going. What happens when all that goes? Do we sustain the intervention or, or don't we? Um, so no, I'd love to talk to you again in, in a couple of years and hopefully we'll, we'll have a better sense with some kind of real um, detailed data on exactly that question. Because there's a big fear that these things don't lead to lasting change. Um, but the, the, again, the jury's out, but no, it's a really interesting question. Great, thank you. And I look forward to that research also. <laughs>
and I, and I look for, we'll have to play a clip from this talk uh, in five years when we have you back to see what happened to Sibs. <laughs> you can, you'll have to rewrite it. So it looks as though I'm technically competent and I didn't have to uh, give up on the uh, PowerPoint. Well, it's been wonderful to, to have you uh, virtually, of course, uh, maybe, maybe that second talk will, will have you in person. Uh, then you won't be able to edit the talk correctly. You won't be able to escape. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate you joining us today, Alec, and, and sharing your research and your thoughts about social impact bonds. It's been a delight. No, I've really enjoyed talking to, to all of you. And um, yeah, um, if, if anyone has any further questions, you've, my, my email's there. Just I'd be happy to talk to, to anyone. Um, and yeah, no, I really love talking to you all and, and good luck with your, with your studies and, um, and yeah, all, all the work going ahead.